Okay, and we are live on YouTube. Um, welcome to this, the second of, a, uh, well, maybe there'll be three of them, um, interviews um, with some of our um, cast members, one of whom, uh, funnily enough, has just gone offline. Um, so um, I'm Lance Nilsson. Um, I edited, it wouldn't be fair to say, I wrote, uh, edited and devised um, the transcript of this production from the public inquiry in 2001 which I personally attended, um, and it's a dramatisation of the Marchioness inquiry um, that followed the Marsh Marchioness disaster 11 years later. Um, and this is why the subheading of the uh, production is 11 years down the river. I'm being joined now by Suzette Plucky, Plucky um, who's another one of the uh, sort of key um key driving hearts at the outcasts and uh, considerably easier on the eye than myself so um welcome suzette great to have you um uh now do you want to maybe just change your name so as we're talking for those people that are uh keep your own name there but for those people that are, are watching at home they know what we're doing um on the production i'm going to do the same because i'm acting in this one I'm not going to talk too much about that because I covered that yesterday. Um, and the other interview is available online. Um, if you want to see more about our work, those people that are watching, please um, subscribe um, and uh, uh, to our channel. We've got a lot of exciting things coming out. We can't put, put too much content out too quickly because we take quite a bit of time um, working on the stuff that we do put out. So... Uh, those people that are waiting to come on, do add your character names next to your own names, please, um, of the people that you're playing in the production. So we're going to have a few of the actors with us um, coming on tonight, uh, as well as another key um, outcast behind the scenes person, the fantastic Anne Haywood, um, who's hopefully her name will be listed as Anne Haywood elsewhere. Um, we're also going to be joined by uh, Res Kempton and um, Ed Glennie. Now, I just want to say before we bring other people on, um, this is taking place on the 20th um, of this month, 20th of August, which is actually the anniversary of the tragedy um, at seven o'clock um, live on our YouTube channel. It's being it's a live table read, so it's not quite the same as the stuff we've done before. It's not officially a production as such because that would entail a lot more rehearsal. We're doing a little bit of rehearsal, not a lot, um, but we are gonna do our best uh, to take people um, uh, to, to the inquiry and give them a, a fairly accurate sense of, of what some of it was like. Um, so it's a live table read of the script. So it's a little bit different um, and we do have some of our parts in, in the script that are supposed to be male are being read by some female actors from the Outcast Creative because uh, we have more women than we have men uh, that are available on the 20th of August. So, um, so you'll have to forgive us for those things. Okay, so um, Suzette, do you want to um, uh, introduce Anne? Yes, Anne Heasel. Haywood, to see you've got me all confused this evening, um, has done the graphic design line. Um, and she's just a, a quiet, steely joy behind every production with her graphic design expertise. So welcome, Anne. Where are you? Hi, Anne. I should Hi. quickly add that the poster that's behind us at the minute, or some of us, um, and Technically didn't design that one. That was done by Christine Moran uh, with myself. And that's actually the cover for the book because uh, the play of the Marchioness Inquiry is being published on Amazon. Um, and that's taken from the cover of the book and, and Anne's also adapted it to a bit of a promo poster. Hi, Anne, good to see you. Hello. Sorry to disturb your Sunday evening. Thank you for coming on board in this impromptu fashion. Um, we're all very organized at the Outcast Creative. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit um, about what you're doing on this one? 
and who you're playing and Suzette, you can also answer that question afterwards. Great, yes. Okay, so I'm playing Annette Russell on this um, production, who was one of the survivors of the um, Marchioness disaster. Um, so yes, she features in the inquiry um, just as one of the witnesses. And um, yeah, she was 26 at the time, head of a, a modeling agency. Um, she was there with a lot of friends because um, it was I think it was her birthday party of one of her or her business partner. Um, so she knew a lot of people on the boat. And um, yeah, I don't know what, what else would you like me to say about her um, dance? Um, no, that's that's great. That's a, that's a good description of Annette. Um, I've met um, Miss Russell personally. She was very helpful with the original production. She met the actress um, who portrayed her. Um, and in fact, the original actress that was going to portray her, a friend of mine, um, Sarah, had to drop out. I forget the reason why, but fairly early on. Um, in rehearsals so um, a friend of hers um, came in and and did a quick read and she was great and that was Emily Outred and uh, Miss Outred um, did the part of Miss Russell in the 2001 production and Miss Russell was kind enough to meet with both actresses even after we lost the first one which must have made us seem all very dreadfully incompetent um, and she spoke to them and, and both of them were, were, were good at nailing her. Um, and I thought they did a very on the nose um, portrayal of her. And um, she was the first person to dive into the water because she saw the collision was inevitable and she, she dived in um, as opposed that's to... Sorry. sorry, I'm just thinking, you know, I think that's so... Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know in that situation, like, but I guess you just go on instinct, don't you? But like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, fortunately, I think she was a reasonably good swimmer because, as we know, the Thames is pretty deadly. Suzette, what about you? What are you, what are you doing on the read through? Um, playing? I'm playing the role of Judy Wellington, who um, unfortunately lost her son Simon. He was only 20 years old at the time. He was a model, very popular, um, and she went through the grief of losing her child, but also the other interesting things that came about after. Um, in regards to burying her child and the things she found out and the things that happened to her. So she wrote a very powerful letter for the inquiry. Yeah, which she read out um, yeah. at the inquiry. And, um, and I believe that took place, that bit may have taken place in the second non-statutory inquiry, which um, there was a public inquiry into the collision. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second, it was, I believe it was called the non-statutory inquiry, which occurred a few months later in early 2001, right before we went into rehearsals. It was, it was I think it was actually running while we were in rehearsals. And um, that inquiry was specifically to look into how the bodies were handled by the coroner mm. and how the relatives were handled by the coroner because a number of the hands were removed from the bodies, 26 of them, I think unnecessarily and then it turned out later that some hands had been returned to the wrong bodies for burial um there was also a hand that turned up in a freezer years later and all of this stuff was handled incredibly insensitively mm. and uh that part of the inquiry wasn't originally in the script and as soon as i heard that testimony it had to go in straight away so i just kind of combined them all into one because uh, mm. that's what you have to do for a dramatization but we make that very clear um both in the original production and, and in this one, that distinction. Um, but it's important to include that. I can't imagine, I mean, can you imagine if that, you're a parent and that happened to you? I just can't imagine it, how I'd feel. Yeah. I'm pretty angry, I think. Mm. <laughs> um, and they had, to, they had to endure that. Yeah. On and on and on. The right bodies as well, wasn't it? The bodies that they were... There was given. some concern that some people weren't sure who they buried. Um, and I think there may have even been some exhumations and things of that nature. I, I, that, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the final outcome was on that. That was still going on, those discussions when the, when the play happened, so it kind of went beyond the timeline that we were dealing with. Um, 
Fantastic. So uh, uh, Anne's going to ask some of us some questions in a bit, but let me bring in um, a couple more of our cast members. Um, Ed, Glennie, um, freshly returned from his exploratory journey of uh, Green Park in, in London, <laughs> where we <laughs> almost <laughs> met. Um, Ed's been in four productions of mine now, but we still haven't managed to meet. Um, <laughs> so, never mind. Um, so, uh, Ed, Green Park, had a good time? It was, it was very nice. nice, very nice. Right? You should have come. It was amazing. I know. <laughs> I, just, no, I didn't get there. So uh, let's talk about the role you're playing in the in the show. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's a few because there's a very very large supply of people, and uh, yeah, there's a large amount of parts to play. And yeah, I'm playing a couple of people. Uh, Tony Perks, which was uh, yeah. I mean, every single person who was involved in the disaster suffered a personal tragedy. Uh, Tony Perks, uh, yeah, Tony he lost, Perks his lost his brother, brother. Stephen, mm. who was twenty-three at the time, which is is yeah, pretty pretty terrible, obviously. I'm um, going to show playing... you the real Tony Perks. He's in this photo, and uh, this is the, this is the cast of the 2001 production. If we zoom in, that is Tony Perks there. Um... Um, and that is me standing next to him. I don't know what I'm doing in that photo. I look like I'm, I'm sort of got indigestion or something. Stephen, very, very happy. Mark Cher, who is sitting here playing Hadgrove, is going to be in the read through on Friday. And again, it's happening this Friday live on our YouTube channel at um, seven o'clock. And will probably last about two and a half hours. Um, Robin uh, is the only person I think that might be missing from this picture of the 2001 cast. There's Emily Outred on the left. Uh, Fiona will also be in our read through on Friday. I believe Robin Pinkney is missing from this picture. And I think she was double cast um, with somebody else and wasn't there the day that this picture was taken, but she was also in the 2001. Production, but as you can see, Ed, you've got pretty similar hair to Tony. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a nice likeness. It's nice to recast people in similar looking roles. I mean, yeah. But as we can sell the beer, <laughs> it's going to have to go again. Well, um, it's it's leaving for uh, something else which I have to do, but that's something I can't no, you can because of NDAs. But yeah, yeah. No, it's. I mean, the other the other part I'm playing is Ian Philpot, who is another person who lost a loved one. He lost his girlfriend in the uh, in, in, in Cole the disaster. Lovely. Yeah, Tamsin Cole, and yeah, she was 24 at the time, which it's it's one of the things about the Marchioness disaster, which is probably one of the most sort of, well, sort of, I don't know what the correct term is, disturbing, touching, I'm not sure what the sort of, what the best word to describe it is. Unsettling, maybe. Such a, unsettling, yeah, it's, it's such a sudden, it's such a sudden loss of life on such a large scale over something so, so very sort of minor in a lot of ways. It, it's a ship collision. It's a ship collision on a on a bridge because of if, as people who've who've seen the original play and people who know about it, but basically because of several bouts of carelessness. So preventable. And, mm. but yeah, it was it, preventable. I mean, Michael Mansfield QC makes that point in his opening statement that the whole thing could have been avoided. Yeah, um, I should give Ian Philpot a shout out as well because he was another one of the. Uh, real characters that we depicted in the 2001 production who met with the cast member who was playing him. Uh, I met him a couple of times. He spoke to me on the phone a couple of times and he was someone I could always call if I had a question, if I had a fact I needed um, clearing up. If Tony didn't know uh, the answer, Tony Perks, then Ian would. Um, and um, yeah, he was a, a, a very um, intelligent and precise person about his um, information, incredibly articulate. And um, uh, he made short work of the lawyers on the stand when they tried to <laughs> drip him up. Um, and I think that comes across in the um, testimony we have with him, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Um, I'd say it does. It's, uh, yeah, I'd say that comes across quite nicely. So just a, a quick question before um, uh, we bring on our, our last actor. Um, this was something that bothered me uh, when I, because I, I wanted to, all, all of my plays, I thought I need to publish my plays, otherwise they're going to be lost forever. And um, 
one of the reasons I decided to publish this one um, was because it, 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 I thought it would probably still be relevant. And I, and I wasn't sure uh, when I, when I went through the transcript again, I thought, is it, we haven't had another, thank God we haven't had another disaster on the river. But I, but in, in preparing for the role, I've been watching the testimony and, and, and cross-examination led by Michael Mansfield QC, who I'm going to be playing on Friday, um, to re-familiarise myself with him again, uh, in the Grenfell inquiry. And the Grenfell inquiry is all online. Um, and actually, there's a lot of parallels. I know it's a fire in a building. It's a very different set of circumstances. But when it comes to the prism of safety as Mr Mansfield refers to it, and the, the, the culture around safety or lack of safety and how that culture develops, which is often to do with saving money and corporate greed, there are a huge number of parallels between the cause and effect of how Marshness happened and how Grenfell happened. And I'm not saying, like, combustible material. I'm not talking about that sort of thing. I'm talking about corporate error. Um, human, human mistakes and very similar mistakes for similar reasons. And I'm talking about greed were made. So that's where I felt that the parallels were. But you guys were not familiar with this material at all. I know some of you knew about the disaster, some of you didn't. Maybe so maybe speak about what you knew before and, and how how the script felt to you, whether it felt relevant or how it felt relevant. Um, Suzette, let's keep the answers pretty brief if we can. A bit to get through, yeah. um, it was the year I turned 16, so it was significant to me because we turned Hillsborough a few days after my 16th birthday, so I felt my year was quite intense right. anyway. So when that happened, um, it was personal to me because a friend of mine from Forest Hill were on the other boat. And we didn't, it's only now I realised how brave they were that they helped save some of the people and they were noted for it um but it's yeah the the uh the relevance of it for me now is um the fact that after the tragedy what the press did to the victims and the slurring of character um but the inquiry i didn't know most of it and i think the tragedy was one one tragedy too much for me so i sort of skipped off in my 16 year old self and went and got into life and didn't really take much notice of it because it was quite a big thing. So yeah, now reading through the script and the detail that's in there and what didn't get to the public or the public ear until years later, it's astounding. So it's, um, yeah, I'm very happy to do it and get the information out there because people just heard it was a boat on the Thames full of party people. Uh, so. And? Um, yeah, I didn't know anything about it at all, um, as is often the case with your scripts, Lance. Um, so I'm getting educated. But um, yeah, I didn't know anything about it before reading it. Um, and obviously then researching the incident. Um, but yeah, it's just horrendous. Um, what a scary, scary thing. And then I was on a boat on the Thames a couple of weeks ago, just thinking, oh God, and it was at night. And I know that this... Um, on some focuses on the um, inquiry, but um, I know we read it. Few, every time I read the script, I'm like just baffled about the lack of the things that you know. Like I said before, like the it was so preventable, and a number of things just leading to chaos. Um, it's horrible. So anyway, um, <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. So yeah. Um. I mean, that alone says to me there's a good reason for publishing the manuscript. And also, of course, the live table read will be available on our channel for some time. Well, it's important um, to remember, like, what horrible things can happen. You know, and, well, and why they happen. And, and we just walk around in, like, a bubble of safety, uh, of, like a kind of bubble of thinking, oh, I don't know, but... Not saying Did you know. find that your, your knowledge of this play, when you were on that boat, made you do things like be more aware of okay where are the exits how would i get out are there life boys where are they is there a life jacket under the seats did you did you find yourself doing those things yeah exactly <laughs> exactly that i was like okay here's the 
Yeah. How far away from shore? Uh, that's okay. it. Did you, do you know if you went through the center arches if, or if you went through the ones on the left or the right? Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I don't, I don't remember which, all I remember about being on the boat recently was, I know we went under Tower Bridge. We saw it. Now you sound like you're on the stand. Uh, let's go to Ed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I knew sadly little about it before I really started reading through the script, but I think sadly it's still got a lot of relevance. And I think there's a very, there's a very big culture of not only corporate greed in terms of safety, but also um, basically in terms of lack of accountability. And I think it's more in general life because we live in very much an age not of individual individual accountability but in terms of there's always something to take a little bit more of the blame away you know everything's done by committee so it's it's the committees to blame there was no one individual to be blamed it was a group decision and we all take a small and there, all these sort of things were evident in the script and all sort of these things are very relevant in a lot of similar cases in grenfell where well, you know, it's not, you know, it's not our fault. The cladding was the problem. It's, it's the problem is the fault of the people who didn't put the fire doors in, but it's not their fault because it's this point. And it's, it's a very, I think, universal thing that we have quite a large problem with, especially in the modern world where finding someone you can, who is it, you're even capable of putting that level of accountability on and saying, well, you're the person who's actually responsible for it going like this is a very, frustratingly difficult thing and the fact that the Marshalness inquiry took 11 years to come to a public inquiry in the first place is shocking in itself but then the behavior of the people who are on the stand who put the same reasoning out there of I'm, I'm unable to remember exactly what was said this was a company-wide decision and not something anyone can be personally held responsible for and it's it's a very I think it's still terrifyingly relevant that that's the way so many things are still dealt with in terms of public safety and public forums that things are seen. I mean, the fact we call it the disaster because a disaster is something you associate with natural disasters, you know, a tsunami, a, a volcano. We don't call it. Well, I don't even know if we have a word for it. But you know, when death is caused by abject negligence, for legal reasons, I should say, possibly caused by abject negligence, then. You know what it what is the word for that it's not a disaster a disaster is something which is unavoidable the volcano goes off and people die there's not a lot you can do about that so it occupies this really strange middle ground where no one wants to take accountability for it but people as in the entity of people are definitely responsible for it happening and i think that's still a very relevant question in terms of what we do in well what we do as a society going forward i guess right no all really valid points and um I mean, I can't help but not mention Afghanistan today. And <laughs> and I've had the news on all day while I've been working, while that absolute human catastrophe is, is playing out. And I know that's a very, very different situation. But if you look at the core um, narrative, um, a play, if you like, you know, the first act was a group of people, powerful people, got together and reacted to something and said, well, we're going to handle it like this. And um, I remember uh, when we got out of, um, it, was it Iraq with Saddam Hussein? When we got out of Iraq, mm -hmm. there was no sort of leaving plan. And that all kind of went a bit wonky. This is far worse than that. Um, and um, uh, so we're now seeing this absolute, um, crisis playing out because of decisions that a lot of old, very powerful men, mostly men, made 20, some 20 years ago. And then uh, this is almost like a microcosm of that because some men wanted to save money and because they didn't do checks, both human checks and um, more procedural things. Uh, um, they weren't checking whether their crews were following standing orders and things of this nature. Uh, men wanted to save money. They didn't do certain things. As a result of that, other things happened. People lost their lives. So the, the kind of chain is, is not dissimilar. And we're seeing these kind of, these chains play out again and again and again in the world. And I'm sort of wondering when the, when's the world going to change? You know, this is my way of trying to affect change, this um, display. That's one of the reasons I um, 
did it in the first place. And you had a question about well, that, I did, didn't you? I was just about to interject. I do have a question about that, which is what us, uh, sorry, what inspired you to get involved in the project? Well, I answer that question. Um, let me bring Rez in, yeah. um, Rez Kempton, who's coming live from Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> he was a bit delayed because he had a foosball table arriving, but he's oh, here yeah. now. <laughs> um, <laughs> a private joke from another play. Please watch the warm up, which was our last play. It was a comedy. So for, <laughs> a lot of the stuff we do do is quite heavy. We do tackle a lot of social issues. So if you watch one of our dramas and you feel it was a bit heavy, go and watch the warm up. You'll have a good laugh. Uh, Definitely. So, Anne, sorry, just to repeat the question, please. So what inspired you to get involved in the project in the first place in 2001 when you first wrote it? So in the year 2000, which is when they started talking about the public inquiry, um, I had a conversation about it with my godparent's son, Justin Bavosi, who's a fantastic photographer. If you Google him, so I'm sure some of his photography work will come up. Um, his surname is B-A-V-O-S-I. And... Um, we were very close as, as children because our parents were best friends. That's why they were, um, his parents were my godparents. So he was like a, like an older brother to me, um, a bit like Rez in that respect. So, um, uh, and um, Justin was supposed to be on the boat that night. I think he knew one of the other photographers or, or he knew one of the models, probably more likely one of the models known Justin. And um, I can't remember the reason that he couldn't go. But he, he knew several people on the boat. I think he knew sort of half a dozen, maybe more. And um, uh, for whatever reason, we met. And, and he said, did you know I was supposed to be on the boat that night? And actually, I did remember him mentioning it previously. And um, the public inquiry is uh, starting in a couple of weeks. You know, you, you just did that play about Hillsborough and you're kind of interested in social injustice. I think maybe you should go down because I'm hearing things about what's been going on behind the scenes and there's a lot that's not being told and, you know, you'd be a good person to put a voice to this story. So I kind of forgot about it and then I think the night before I got a phone call, you go down to the inquiry tomorrow, starting tomorrow. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, I'll get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and I've got insomnia at the minute and I don't know about this. Uh, if I wake up, I'll go. And um, it's one of those weird things where I just suddenly woke up at six o'clock and I couldn't get back to sleep. So I was like, okay, I'll go. And um, I, it was either Blaney or H Henderson who was the first witness up. It was one or other of them. I can't remember which. That's so long ago. Um, and a lot's happened since then, as you know. But um, as soon as I walked in, I'd heard about 10 minutes of testimony and that was it. I had a notebook with me. The notebook was full by the end of the day and I was there all day. And I not only made notes on all the testimony, but I also made notes on who came in, who came out, who was watching what, um, who was reacting to what. And I started identifying people I needed to talk to. And within, within a week, I was talking to the Perks family, I think, you know, within, within five days. And then I was introduced to Eileen Delalio, um, who's the mother of um, Lawrence Delalio, who, of course, used to play for the England rugby team. And she lost her daughter Francesca, Francesca. Um, and Eileen was just she was a, a an amazing force of nature um, and these people took me into their hearts and they trusted me they didn't know me and, and I, I just said I want to do this play about this I think it's important I'm not quite sure what where I'm going with it yet but I'm going to be here every day and that was it I was there every day and I think I only missed two days if I remember rightly because I was ill and um, yeah, and I just started working on it and editing it like, straight away. Every time I identified a character, I had to reread all of his testimony and then or hers and work out what were the key things I wanted from that witness. That also, so, sorry, I've got a follow up. I, yeah, go on. If you've got more to say, say, I just wanted to know as well. Um, with the original play then, um, yep. it's obviously quite complex. There's a lot of characters and we saw the photograph earlier of, um, of the set. Yeah, I'll pop it up again, actually. Uh, yeah, we, don't, we don't rest to miss out on any of the treats, you know. No, but yeah, no, go on, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, you know, it, it looks great, uh, really interesting, but it also looks like quite a, a busy set. It's obviously a complex play, lots of characters, and you yeah. on the London Fringe with a, obviously a 
little to very small budget. So I'm just wondering how 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 was it putting that on? Uh, the challenges that you had. You know what? My first instinct was to say, "Oh my god, it was so hard," which it was. But I did plays that was so much harder to produce than this. One of which, you know, it finished with me ending up in hospital. Um, that actually, when I look back at Marchioness, it feels like it was relatively easy compared to those. But just let's let's put that in perspective. Um, it was not easy. Um, you know, if anyone knows, if you do play on the London Fringe, you're not doing it for the money. And I tried to get a budget for it. And um, as you know, we're, we're this is the original cast. Again, I just show them. And uh, again, I said this yesterday. I'm going to say it again. Big thank you to all of them who took part. Um, it could not have happened without them. And um, I think about two thirds of the cast played two parts. About two thirds. And then we had some people on stage who didn't speak at all. Um, so uh, it was really difficult because the only money I had in my savings, because uh, I wasn't working, you know, like, you know, an income at the time, um, was um, I think I had about £800, something like that. And that was the budget. <laughs> uh, and it, this was for a two-week production which had six weeks of rehearsals. I think we did about four, three evenings a week and, and, and all day Sunday, I think we did. And then I think, you know, the week before, I think we did every night. Um, I mean, I can't remember, I'm guessing, but that sounds like a large schedule for this sort of thing. And uh, don't have to schedule anymore, you know. But um, so, yeah, it was it was really hard. And, um, and I lost one actress fairly early on, not because she didn't want to do it, just a clash thing came up, which is, you know, that's how it goes. And, um, but the, we, the cast were up for it. I think some of them were a bit sceptical at first and they probably didn't understand why I wanted to do it. But, um, but they were great and they really threw themselves into it. They, like I said, they went and met their real counterparts and it was a challenge to direct it. I also did two really small roles in it, one of which Rez is playing, uh, who I'll introduce in a second. And um, uh, I'm not a believer of... of uh, actors directing themselves. So I actually had somebody come in and work with me separately to direct my testimony. And then I directed everybody else in the main rehearsals. So well, I'm not sure the actors knew that actually, I probably didn't mention that to them. Um, one of those people that worked on my scenes with me was the late Graham Fletcher Cook, who um, used to run Timber Theatre and, and several of the actors came from Timber. So yeah, so Anne, it was it was it was tough, but it was rewarding. And do you know what? When I look back on it now, because we've just found video footage of it, we thought it had all been lost, and we've just found some. And when I look at it, the quality of the performances and just what we achieved for so little is nothing short of amazing. Mm. You, you know, people today wouldn't put on a play of this scale for anything less than a budget of fifty grand, and even then, I think they'd say that's small. Yeah. Um, we did it on the London off West End. I mean, it was Jackson's Lane, so it's not really a theatre above a pub. It's a full size proper theatre, seats 130, big space, just as well because it's a big cast. But you, I don't know. I don't know many people that would just sort of do that because they cared, and that, that was that was that was all the motivation I needed really. Um, there were other factors, but. It, was, it just needed, I just knew it needed to be done. So I'm just going to introduce Rez Kempton, who's joining us from live from LA. Thank you. Um, Hi. I have been uh, here, I've been listening in uh, everything. So yeah, I was going yeah. to say, Lance, just more one, one thought occurs to me. Do you think in the time that you did that then, that production, and how we're doing a read of it now, in terms of how it's received, what, what, are, you, what are you feeling about that? How was it received then? And what, what, what are you hoping to... Um, receive now. Well, when we did it, sorry, I'm just multitasking here. When we did it um, back then, the first, the, before I actually kind of, I started, you know, I, I decided I was going to stay in the inquiry. I wasn't sure if I was going to do the play. Hmm. And I, 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 I knew that I couldn't do the play unless I had the blessing of kind of key people involved. Sure. Um, so, I learned fairly early on that there were two groups 
uh, there'd been a bit of a division and there were two groups. There was the Marshness Action Group and there was the Marshness Contact Group. And it just was just so happened that the people that I spoke to were in the Marshness Contact Group. And I didn't want to get involved in um, the politic of what was going on with all that because that was not my job. My job was mm. to tell this story to the best of my ability and highlight the issues that I felt were important and bring them to the attention of a wider public. Hmm. And that might have only been two weeks worth of people coming to the theatre, but you don't know how many people they're going to talk to about it. And this is sure. all pre-internet and social media, of course. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, we had hopes of, you know, maybe getting the national interested in stuff like that. But I didn't really understand how those systems all worked back then. And now I do. So it doesn't work like that. People don't come around. Right. Like, yeah, I'm going to give you your show. It's all it's all conversations in different places. But um yeah, so I, I mean, I, I had hopes that we might get it somewhere else, but I didn't really believe that we would because we just didn't have the, the, the publicity or the power sure. or the connections. Um, but um, it, that, anyway, sorry, so to answer your question, the Martianist contact group were extremely supportive. That's how we had access to all those people. Eileen Delalio came to see the play, I think, three or four times. Right. Um, uh, the Perkses came two or three times. Tony Perks came almost to every wow. show. Um, wow. he, I think he and Phil Pop came. I think he and Phil Pop came. Barbara Davis came, who is the mother of Jonathan Davis, who's the first witness in the show, uh, who I played. And I, I, I met Jonathan. I can't remember if we spoke on the phone or in person, but we definitely spoke. Um, and then there were a number of survivors that came down who I, I don't want to start naming names because I'm my memory of like you know is all gone so um but there, there were a number of survivors that came yeah um uh, i don't know i can't remember the numbers but there, you know there was somebody there every night that was directly connected to it more than one yeah it is um i mean i've been lucky to be involved in a few productions where um it's about real events and so real people mm. and you know it is i mean as an actor with us <laughs> yeah, you know, including with that. Yeah, exactly. When we when we when we did it as well, Kent State, right? Um, so, um, but actually live, and then actually actually meeting the person after the show, because this happened to me a couple of times now, where I've played someone, and the person is in the audience who I'm playing. I don't know about you guys how that. It's a huge responsibility. You really feel it, you know. And um, so um, I can only imagine back then with such an emotive subject as well. I mean, I did a play about the London riots at the Almeida. And um, I, you know, we were playing people that were real and, and, you know, over the course of the run, people that we're portraying came to the, came to the play. Although I never knew when my, when my guy was going to arrive because we'd heard that. And then as a cast, we decided we don't want to know, <laughs> actually, don't tell us when they're going to come. So, yeah. And then the, the, the thing afterwards, meeting them. But it's a huge responsibility. You know, it is. Yeah, yeah. You feel it, don't you, you know, when we're having to do that. And obviously oh, yeah. as the creator of the piece, Lance, even more so because, you know, you're putting words in people's mouths and it's, uh, it's I can, you know, I've never done that. I've played someone, but have to create the words that they have to say and, you know, the story that, that, that we're portraying, um, it's a huge responsibility. And um, Well, I wrote to Michael Mansfield um, the other day uh, just to let him know that this was happening. And right. I've lost contact with all the Marshness contact group people and some of them have passed away some of them have moved right. abroad and they're a lot of them are not on social media at right. all. They're, not, they're not that generation or they don't want to be right um so i contacted mr mansfield and actually just to let him know i was playing him on friday oh right and um <laughs> what did he say um, did he get back he's gonna be watching is what he told me how is he <laughs> i wonder if he remembers me because i've worked with him <laughs> well well, we'll find out, <laughs> won't we? We'll find out. We? We'll work with um, him. It was one of the first. I mean, no pressure. You know, he's only got the biggest. Um, and I, I, I don't normally do big acting roles in our stuff. Um, but this was a, a, a this because this is just a table read, and it was a bit of a last minute decision to go ahead with it. Sure. It just seemed like a logical thing to do because the yeah. play's being published, and um, you know, uh, yeah. and it will be available on Amazon. Pretty soon, that's within right. like within like seventy two hours or something, it's going to oh, be. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah the, the dummy copies are already on their way to my house, so um, and you can get it on Kindle, you can get it on Kindle and and imprint. Sorry, Angon. I was saying people can can uh, read it and watch at the same time. Mm. 
They can, and there's a whole section. <laughs> there's a whole section in the book about how the play came to be. Um, to the best of my recollection, some people had to help me with that. Um, and there's there's a little bit of background um, to the to the disaster itself, of course, and how the public inquiry came to be. Uh, all the original cast from the 2001 uh, production are, are listed. I'm pretty sure we've got it 100 correct. Uh, and all the outcasts are listed who are taking part in the read through on. Uh, on Friday are also in, in there in a different, you know, under a different heading, but um, they're all in there as well because just wanted to kind of pass on that. Thanks. So, um, it, I mean, I played Dixie Stefano last time who you're also, you're playing. Yeah. And I met him. And, oh, you did? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And I emulated him down to a T when I was on the right. stand. Because I remember he was chewing chewing gum. I remembered that when he was on the stand. And I think actually Lord Justice Clark told him to take his chewing gum out. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And, and so you will I think I showed a video clip of it that I found and I sent it to our WhatsApp group. And you can see I'm chewing chewing gum all the way through the yeah. testimony, which is quite funny. So there you go, Rez, there's a little character. Chewing there. gum on standby. Yep. <laughs> Noted. Yeah. <laughs> Noted. Who is your character? Exactly. Who is your Rez character, Rez? He's yeah, a, talk, about, talk about your characters. Yeah, he's doing more than one, I think. I yeah, I'm, I'm playing a couple of lawyers as well. So um, one of the things about, you know, being in the outcast and that, you know, we share and distribute the, the, the parts out and things. And in, in this, I'm playing a number of, like, um, uh, parts in it, you know, um, because there's, even though as big as it is, I mean, as big as, you know, members of the outcast is, this is a big production with how many at people in it, Lance. Yeah, there's about well, there's over twenty. Yeah, exactly, over so twenty. So, we've got know. we've got three new people coming in because we didn't have enough men exactly. available. So it's not all of the outcasts are always available for everything. Of course, yeah. And it, so doubling it, up, I'm playing a couple of lawyers as well. Well, QCs, you know, representing one representing the doctor, and the, um, right. um, yeah. So. Um, it's it's great to be able to do that and, and chop and change roles as well, you know, which we're all adapt at now, <laughs> especially on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, quick quick change of uh, you know glasses, hat, whatever, <laughs> to kind of identify it. Well, the good uh, thing about glasses, this... hat, and accent. Yeah, hat and accent. Yeah, <laughs> always helpful. <laughs> the, the good Definitely. thing about this play is that it, 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 the stuff that we pick to do online is always very much talking heads. Yeah. And. Um, Anything that, if it works as a radio play, I think I said this yesterday, then it, it can work on on YouTube. Um, well, we've been ambitious. We've done things like Henry, you know, Henry V. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we've done Shakespeare. I <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't say that's just a normal talking head play. But yeah, yeah, we've got we've got um, uh, Shakespeare himself, or Henry Henry himself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ed Glenny. Um, exactly. So. With us. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, Zoom, Zoom's always one of those things. I've always thought that it suited very talking head dramas, and I've always thought that's where its strengths lay because you get a little bit more of, or, or alternatively, you just write stuff that's based in Zoom. But I always think that's limiting your genre to yeah. office-based dramas, which is fine. But there's a lot more you can do, and you know, yeah. adapting things to a radio play, but with a talking box, I think is a very very good use of the medium. Yeah, sure. I think yeah, it's come a long way and been, we've been quite innovative in terms of um, what we've done um, um, with the productions yeah. we've done. Definitely, I mean, recreating the battle on, you know, on the beaches and Normandy <laughs> and, you know, we've, we, it's been pretty impressive, you know, and the large landscapes of the shows we have done. I mean, yeah, Kent State was a five-part but not just, we know, we didn't just cover just the courtroom. I know the Marchioness we do, but, you know, we, we were covering homes, how people were affected and out, their lives outside that. So, yeah, it's been very powerful. Mm. And Yeah, okay. Kent State was particularly ambitious because I really wanted to show yeah. what I wanted to do with it. Um, yeah. And, and behind uh, the scenes, you know, not just when the courtroom, but actually behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, the court, the court transcripts were the, were the spine of the piece, but... but yeah. The interpersonal relationships and the Absolutely. dramas that played outside that were really important. Sure. Um, there was a lot of that going on with this as well. I mean, I this was a big journey, and it, it, for, for all the people involved. Um, yeah. And um, 
you know, I don't think that they ever got complete satisfaction out of it, but they they did. I think they did come to terms uh, or, or find some people found closure. I think, but but yeah. um, how can you? You know, it's so. Oh, it's I don't know how. I don't know how I could. Um, I, it's yeah. it's a very difficult thing. I mean, that's the one thing that I do worry about is because um, I was asked this question earlier about then and now. And I was in regular contact with the Marshness contact group then, but I think as an organisation, they've kind of wrapped up now. Um, right. I do worry about opening up old wounds. And is, oh, someone's going to see it online who was affected by it. And, oh. But, you know, with YouTube, everything is a click on and a click off. So it's not like it's broadcasting into your home on the telly, um, on BBC One. Um, so that there has been many documentaries made about this, you know, as part of a disaster series or whatever. And some of them have involved people that were there and some of them have involved less or different people. Right. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure if one of them pops on in the living room, it, it's not great for the people that were there because it's a, a reminder. But the legacy that this narrative um, resulted was vastly improved safety on the River Thames. Mm. Um, there wasn't a dedicated lifeboat station on the River Thames before the Marshness disaster. There is now. Right. And that's because of the parents campaigning for one. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Lockwood Croft, Eileen Delalio, Barbara Davis, I think there was another lady, um, but I know the three of them in particular campaigned really hard specifically for that thing. And right. it is the busiest lifeboat station in the UK. It's had oh. more call-outs than any other. Oh. Um, okay. So, I mean, that's a great um, uh, result. Sure. But I think it's important to understand the, the things that, that, that led us there to make sure that we never go back. Um, and I don't think anybody that was on that boat would ever want to see anything like that happen again. No, of course. And, there was a there was a comment made. I, I've made reference to this at, at the beginning of the manuscripts about the background of the, the show. There was a comment made in a recent public inquiry into a, into a rail a, a near miss rail disaster, where the guy who was writing up the report um, said it almost feels like the lessons from Hatfield are slowly fading from yeah. memory. Because this was this was nearly, a, you know, these trains missed each other by inches, and the circumstances were very similar to, to the Hatfield crash. And uh, uh, I just think, you know, it's important to remind people of what happened and why, so that we can make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, I know it's difficult for some people to relive it, but because of the medium that we're using, I think it's it's also a lot easier for them to. Well, that's okay. I don't want to watch that. And that's okay. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I, that's my fear, but, but this is also my reasoning for, for wanting to get it out yeah. there. And, and, you know, I did this completely for free. I, I dedicated six months of my life to it. I, I suppose there is also a bit of, I just kind of don't want it to be lost. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I wanted to, 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 to get it out on Amazon as well. Um, but yeah, so uh, final thoughts then, because we don't want to go on too long. I think we're, we're yeah, no, sure. Uh, um, mm. But um, uh, maybe we'll do final thoughts, or if anyone's got any other questions that they, they think for anybody here, it doesn't have to be for me. Um, we all want to know where Rez got his shirt. I mean, that's an obvious, uh, obvious mm. question for later. <laughs> but but um, yeah, so I'm quite nervous about doing. Friday because like I said I'd, I'm normally behind the scenes maybe doing a little acting role here and there maybe a dodgy American You're a dead ring of him Lance don't worry I work with him so you know as I said you know <laughs> but, um, couldn't, couldn't tell the difference <laughs> yeah I will cease to be Lance Nielsen on Friday and yeah, I'll be exactly. I'll be somebody else yeah. um yeah but it yeah it's gonna I like pushing myself and I like acting I that's what I wanted to do be before I came a writer Right, mm. and as I get older, I find I miss it more. Yeah, you're getting I like... stronger. I feel as well as an mm. actor. You're getting you're getting stronger as an actor. Well, we're thing. doing so much stuff all the time. We're just mm. we're constantly keeping ourselves busy, aren't we? With the outcasts, yeah. we're 
it's like a gym. People pop in, people pop out. And that's fine as well. People give what time. And I think it really what, what you've done, Lance, really, apart from moving it, you know, from, you know, when you were having it in person and, you know, where did you have your classes? And we were doing acting classes on Monday nights in Old yeah. Street. Uh, Dick right. Carlson, who's the co-founder of the of course, is, is more of a teacher and I'm like the writer director. So I would work out the scenes we were doing and, and talk about character and maybe the motivation and background of those characters and maybe what the scene was should be about or what the actors were trying to convey well, in the scene. And Dickon would look at technique and breathing and distance and physicality and, and movement. And you the know. move to Zoom has been incredible. I mean, you know, the advancement, I think, I've not seen yet a Zoom production or anything like that as, you know, involved in, in what, what, what you're doing, you know, what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's been a really um, interesting way to explore a new medium and yet develop it, you know, getting better at it as well. Sure. And I'm so. sure it will go further. You know, there's going to be ways of the people that invented it will probably incorporate new features that will because i don't think they envisaged that people were going to use it for this purpose it was a it business was, it, was, it was it was a it was software for conferencing exactly yeah. exactly software not for performance no. but you know pretty soon there'll be something called zoom platinum performance and we'll all have to upgrade and pay 250 <laughs> quid to use it and this mm. one will become obsolete and we won't be allowed to log on to it again and it'll be like Final Cut Pro, God forbid. Um, <laughs> which, you know, once I paid £100 for, and I should still be able to use, but I can't. <laughs> so, um, oh, yes. You know, yeah. but that may happen. Um, and uh, any other thoughts or questions? Um, not at the moment. No? Looking, well, how are you feeling about Friday? Um... How am I feeling? I'm feeling good about Friday. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hearing it again um, in full with everybody because I don't think I've we've had a full run through with everybody who's. Uh, no, and I mean I know we're running it tomorrow, but I don't think we'll have everybody tomorrow either. So yeah, yeah um, so oh, we, 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 this is a table read. Emphasise again. Yeah, it's not a um, uh, a rehearsed production like our other stuff. So there has been a bit of rehearsal, a little bit, but not a lot. So it's going to be the best table read that we can make it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, it's pretty good on um, last Monday, I thought. Mm. That's the first read through. So. Yeah, but the running time was a tasty three hours, which uh, <laughs> I know that we, when we were doing the production live, we got it to two hours, 20 minutes. Um, oh, wow. I, didn't, I did make some cuts, which were in, I think we were working off an older, or, or, or the, the script that before we went into rehearsal. 2001 i realized there was some stuff in it that we had cut so i, I made all those cuts but i yeah i mean, we still need to you know get kick, kick the pace and but the good thing is it's on zoom so you know if someone wants to go to the toilet it will still be there on our channel they can pause it and come back and watch it or watch it the following day if they watch the first half now and the second half later you know they get bored of uh, the other dramas on um other channels that have <laughs> of historical inaccuracies and want to see something that's not. So if, if they get bored of oh. Channel Four, you know they can. Uh, I didn't yeah. mention. No, I didn't mention any channel. I just said I, channel. I didn't. I wasn't implying that they were responsible for any of those. Just, uh, just an example. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Suzette. Um, yeah, I. I believe that every year it would be a trigger for the families either way. Every anniversary. Um, but I feel they'd also feel horrified if it happened again and the, their story's got lost. And so sometimes I think the powers that be need to know that she's still relevant, we still think of it, people are still affected by it, regardless of how long time has passed. So um, I think it's still very important that people, because people still have a very light, um, it's sort of got swallowed up with the Hillsborough thing, but so people had a very light, um, what's the word? The Marchioness <laughs> did get very overlooked, um, yeah. I feel, because of it Hillsborough. Did. And and I mean, look, I did a play about Hillsborough. Hillsborough was, yeah. you know, we could talk about that. And funny enough, we are going to do a read through of the Hillsborough play that I did, by the way, my first uh, play that won an award. Um, and um, 
I don't know whether we're going to do it online, but we're going to do it within the outcast anyway, just to, to read it sometime. Um, Ed and Anne are already getting their Liverpool accents ready. Um, <laughs> but you're right, it, it, it did get eclipsed a little bit. And um, I remember, I think there was a, I don't know if there was a song for Hillsborough, but there was some kind of fundraiser that got a lot of money. And I think there was a, there was a song for Marchioness, the victims of the Marchioness, and it didn't raise a lot. Um, and that was because of what you talked about, Suzette, about the press narrative of this was a boat full of young, rich people who were good looking and came from affluent families. So, you know, listen, you really shouldn't care about them that much. Mm. And that was a narrative that was propagated deliberately mm -hmm. to take focus away from it so that the people who had shares in the company Ready Mixed Concrete that owned the Bow Bell didn't, you know, those things didn't come to light until much, 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 much later. Yeah. Um, and that's why we know the public inquiry was delayed the way it was. Um, and it's a real shame. Um, uh, they should have got as much sympathy um, as anybody should who loses a loved one in these kinds of oh, circumstances. Yes. Mm. Um, it's not a, it's not a competition, you know. I would need to be clear about this. Um, but these were these were both. We, we were in it. The eighties was an era of terrible tragedies. You know, the King's Cross fire, Piper Alpha, mm -hmm. and. Um, but most of them resulted in changes for the, the better. Of course, um, Hillsborough completely changed the landscape of football. But it took an awful long time for people to get closure with these things because people would not say they were sorry. People would not, you know, is it Elton John that sang that song, Sorry Sometimes is the Hardest Word? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it really is when, you know, there's legal implications and this and this and this. We saw that with Kent State as well. We did see that with Kent State. And I think what, what people need to realise, if you make a mistake and, it, and that mistake costs somebody their life, that's awful. And if you're a decent human being, your own life for making that mistake is probably going to be ruined because you're, that's going to haunt you if you've got any kind of conscience for the rest of your life. So the best thing that you can do when they're ready to hear it, and I ain't going to be ready to hear it the next day, but when they're ready to hear it, is apologise and say, I, I, I fucked up. I you know, there's no, no, no words can bring your loved one back, but I should have done better and I will try and do better. Because that at least will, you know, that humanity, I believe that gesture of humanity makes a big difference to people. Then people will not want to hear it straight away. They might not be ready to hear it for years, but um, you know, if you, did, if you deny them their rights and you deny them their justice and you deny them their voice in the narrative of their grief, you're enforcing that grief on them forever and never be able to shut it, shut it down or heal. Uh, and I think an apology is a really important part of the healing process. And when it comes really late after a really long time, it, 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 it doesn't have the same meaning when you know that it could have come a lot sooner and people have kind of been forced to say it. It doesn't yeah. mean as much. So, you know, I mean, that's maybe a good point to, to wrap things up on. But um, so it's... Um, Another piece of serious work from the Outcast Creative, um, <laughs> talking about social injustice and uh, the things that we think are important. Um, this is a read through of the 2001 production uh, of the Marshness Inquiry. It's live, so we haven't got room to make mistakes. It is live, as if we're performing it on stage, but it is a read through uh, with minimum rehearsal. This Friday at seven o'clock, be about two and a half hours with a five minute um, interval during which time Ed will entertain the audience through the medium of interpretive dance. <laughs> um, well, I had to lighten the mood a little bit. Apologies exactly. for anyone watching. Please don't think I trivialise what we're doing. Um, but we, we, we need to keep a sense of humour at the outcast because we do do a lot of quite serious work. And if we don't joke with each other occasionally, I think it, gets, it can get a bit overwhelming. Cool. Um, and I, ha I have found some of the productions that I've done um, well, there was one in particular that, that, that I realised left me with PTSD afterwards. 
because I got so into it. I was so in it. I went so deep with it. And it took me a long time to sort of extricate my, myself. Mm. And you find yourself, you find yourself apologising to people like, oh, I wish I could have done more. And, you know, um, and you start, you start feeling guilty. And it's, well, what, you're actually trying to help, you know? <laughs> so, but it, that can happen. So you, you do need to keep levity in your life. It's very important when you do, especially when you're doing this kind of work. Mm. Um, great. Rez, last thoughts from LA? Before you go and um, install the jacuzzi upstairs oh yeah exactly um no um yeah please uh, i think it's an important piece of work um you know part of history that is still relevant in terms of you know listening to you guys talking about other things that have happened the grenfell and everything else that we spoke about um if you know about it you know um there'll be there'll be surprises and things in it that that um that come out you know, I didn't know a, a great deal. And if you don't, then I think it's an important part of history um, to know that, you know, this, this actually took place, so. And what went on behind the scenes. Absolutely, yeah, because it's, yeah. It's never as black and white as it appears. No, exactly. Anything like this. Um, yeah. Uh, Ed? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's still a very relevant issue, but I think there's there's a saying which comes from some several American fire departments, which is fire. It's something on the lines of fire safety regulations are always written in blood. And I think it's pretty much the same with almost every safety regulation. And I mean, everyone's very content to say, well, it's OK, nothing's going wrong. But it turns yeah. out things are going wrong. It's just until they go so catastrophically wrong, you can't ignore them anymore. People assume the regulations you have are just fine you know everything's okay and there's there's an event in america. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's true there's there's an event in america called the uh, the station nightclub fire which is uh yeah particularly harrowing where i think 100 yeah, people died yeah i remember that and again it's it's something which is it's a really sort of it's just a tragic thing because all of everything's caused by just small bits of negligence just small bits of negligence the owner was absolutely catastrophically gutted about what happened even though he was partially responsible but nobody ever thinks that the things that they fail to do in small ways will lead to anything bad happening especially on the scale that bad things do that's happen. like when they had uh, they had chains on the fire exit doors didn't they and things like that. uh no no that was another one in the uk this was uh, this was an event with uh, dubious fireworks on stage soundproofing on the stage unfamiliar caught, with fire, fire exits yeah fire. and uh, yeah, there's, there's a video of it, which I would not recommend people watching. It's a particularly no, no. heavy video to watch, but yeah. the fire spreads in about, within about 45 seconds. It I, remember is abjectly, it, I remember it being on the, being on the news. Yeah. yeah, 45 seconds, the building's impossible to get out of safely. Within two minutes, it's, it's yeah. done. Yeah. The whole no, thing's I remember, done. I remember, I remember. Two minutes. Good, good, good but, parallel example there. Uh, and... We're going to lose Rez shortly, so let's. Um, he's he's the, the jacuzzi's arriving, <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, Rez, if you do have to whiz off, yeah, I'm going to say bye off. and um, see, see you guys on Friday, yeah, 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 sure. On Friday, Take care, everyone, bye. Bye. bye bye. Is that hours behind the rest of us? Why has he got to go? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so sorry, go on, Anne. Uh, final thought, um. Um, well, I think I'm a bit late yeah, it actually wrapped it up really nicely there. So, um, <laughs> I don't have any further, um, thoughts other than to say, please, uh, yeah, do come and watch. If you're... Oh. Right, Suzette, anything apart from you will have your background sorted uh, by Friday, of course. Um, yes, um, yes, <laughs> do come and watch the show. I think it'd be interesting for people of my generation that were sort of. Yeah, we're London. probably aware of it, but but not yeah. not Didn't aware of the narrative that let sort of followed, and yes. that would be interesting for them to hear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, very relevant, I think. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so um, thanks very much uh, for tuning in. Those of you that are watching or watch subsequently when we're not live, um, the play of the Marchioness Inquiry will be available on Amazon uh, in paperback and on Kindle. Um, I think from next week. Um, uh, so you'll be able to grab a copy of that. Um, and we um, will be live, of course, on Friday, uh, the 20th of August, 
So that's this Friday coming, so now Sunday. Um, time is flying, can't believe it's already August. And um, uh, we will be going live at approximately seven o'clock. Uh, we hope to keep the running time under two and a half hours, the original uh, running time, uh, but well, we will see. So do join us then um, at, the, uh, at the read through the live table read. Uh, well, the Outcast Creative will be giving it their all um, to bring you a very visceral um, table read experience live online, 7 p.m. start. Thank you very much for watching and joining. Do hit the subscribe button and uh, check out our content and our other shows that are online. There's plenty for you to watch. And uh, we'll